and turn to the back of the Evangelism Simplified Guidebook. I want you to write this website down in the notes section. So go ahead and open your guidebook. Go to the very rear of the uh, book and you'll see a, no a section for notes. We're going to take some important information down tonight. So this is, uh, this is evangelism.housetohouse.com. Write that down. Don't put a www in front of it. It's what we sometimes call a concealed website. In other words, this is really designed for members of the church. This is training material. This is how to reach out. These are soul winning uh, um, articles. This is a soul winning strategy. Write down evangelism.housetohouse.com. I want you to visit that website because this is going to equip you even further to be a soul winner. Welcome to the House to House, Heart to Heart School of Evangelism. This is a dream come true for my family. I have loved evangelism from my youth, and I, I've always loved to be in Bible studies and be soul winners. And uh, to, to be able to take my family, to travel literally across the country, and to go from church to church and just focus on the mission of the gospel and training families and training churches how to be soul winners is, uh, is, is, is got to be one of the greatest blessings of life. I just thank God to be with you tonight. My wife, Nicole, is sitting in the, in the back with my, next to my father, Gary, my, my daughter, Hannah, and my son, Jared. And we're just, we're, we're just overwhelmed uh, to be in your presence tonight with Christians. The Bible says it's good when brethren assemble together in unity. And we can go all over the country, go into a church of Christ, and immediately we're received with warm wishes, salutations, I feel the warmth of family uh, unity, and I'm grateful for that tonight. Uh, this, is a, this is a boot camp, if you will. This is not a gospel meeting. This isn't a lectureship. This is something very different. This, the purpose of this event is to change, and listen to me very carefully, because change is a scary word. I understand. The purpose of this event is to change the culture of every church of Christ where we step foot in. Because we know that the culture of the Church of Christ in the last 30 and 40 years has resulted in, 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 in the condition that we find ourselves today. And it's not good. And if we don't change the culture intentionally and focus on this, it's just going to continue in the same direction. And I'm going to point this out very clearly in about five minutes. This is an evangelistic boot camp. You are enrolled in school. And so my purpose in this is to equip you with the training and tools that you need to do things differently. In other words, I want you to be able to address a problem that we're facing right now in churches of Christ. If you're unaware of it, you're going to be aware very soon. And if, it not, if it's not addressed head on by churches of Christ, it's going, to, it's going to consume us. And most members of the church have no idea where we're at right now. They don't, under, they, they don't see it because they're in their own world, their own congregation... They don't see what's going on around them. I'm traveling all over the country and I'm seeing it from elders and preachers. There's something happening. It's been happening now for about 30, 40 years. And um, it's a trajectory. It's a direction. And it's frightening when you look at it. The Bible says this, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. There isn't a more wise thing for this church to do than to focus on this subject. Of all the subjects, you can focus on marriages, I'm all for marriages. You can focus on children, I love children. You, you can focus on uh, uh, depression, anxiety, you can, uh, you can focus on prayer, you can focus on all... I mean, there's a lot of things that we, can, we need to focus on. This one, by far, is the most important, not because I'm your speaker. It's the most important because Jesus said it. Dear friends, he gave you not three commissions, he gave you one. He gave you one commission. When he, when he was preparing to leave this earth, Jesus looked out into the world. He says, go ye therefore and teach. Now, there's a lot of other things that we need to do. But this is the one commission he gave Christians. We can, we can ace every other area. Brethren, if we fail in this area, we have failed as the church. This is where, this is where it all matters. So there isn't a wiser course of action for you to take than this right here. Now... There are some things that you need to know as we, we progress. Every person in the audience tonight should have been given an evangelism simplified guidebook. At least every married couple may have a husband and wife. If you want your own, that's all right. And a back to the Bible. If you don't have that, raise your hand now. If you do not have this, raise your hand now and we will bring, you need it. Because we're going to refer to it. This is your training manual for these particular sessions. Now, number two, there is a clipboard being passed around from 
from back to front. Now, when you get it, here's why I'm asking for this information. Put your name. If you're from a congregation other than Grabber Road here, put the name of the church. If you're from Katy, if you're from another congregation, just list the name of the church. Make sure your name is on there. Give me your address and email, and here's why. Because you're enrolled in school. You're now a student of evangelism. And I'm going, to, I'm going to send you every Wednesday information to help improve and hone your skill set. I'm going to send it. There's no charge for it. I'm going to give it to you because you're enrolled. And this is going to be not just informational. It's going to be, it's going to be educational. It's going to be motivational. I'm going to give you reports from the nine churches we have already trained this year. My family started the second week of January. This is our ninth congregation. And we go from church to church and we just train churches. Now, I think results matter. I'm result-oriented because results matter. Brethren, I didn't step out of the pulpit after 24 years of full-time preaching just to work, just to, just to travel. I did that because I believe that there's, there's such an urgent need right now for this subject and for this training. It's so urgent, and if I'm not seeing a difference, I'm going to go right back into local work in the pulpit. But I'm seeing things where we're training these churches happen that we haven't seen in a long time. And I, I want to share this exciting news for, with you. So every Wednesday morning, you're going to get a report. You're going to get a report from BCS, because that's where we were earlier. You're going to get a report from North Jefferson and Mount Pleasant. We were just there. You're going to get a report from North Tuscaloosa. You're going to get a report from Mercedes Drive. You're going to get a report from all these churches, and they're going to tell you what's happening in their church. Not my words, their words. So if what I'm teaching doesn't work, you can listen to them. But if what we're teaching works, you're going to see a difference. You're going to see noticeable changes taking place, not in the doctrine, but in the culture of that local church. There's a change of emphasis. They're becoming very intentional on the most important mission on earth. They're becoming very focused on the mission of Christ. If the mission of Christ is not your mission, it's very hard to be like Christ. Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. If we're not seeking and saving the lost, it's hard to be like Jesus. Now, I want to lay out this format for you. I'm going to kind of give you direction. Here's where we're going. My first job tonight is to convince you that evangelism works in America. I didn't say that evangelism works because you know it works in India. You know it works in Jamaica. We know it works all over the world. But I'm, 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 my job tonight is to convince you it works in our country and specifically in Rosenberg, Texas. Because if we can't, if we can't practice evangelism here, brethren, if all we can do is go overseas and practice evangelism, we're in trouble. So I've got a tall mountain to climb tonight because I realize that most of you in the audience, you don't have to tell me, you don't have to shake your head yes or no. You don't believe this works. You haven't seen it work in a long time. Some of you in the pews, here's your thought. America's gone. We can't save it. We're just trying to hold out. We're like the Alamo. Santa Ana's army has surrounded us, and let's just hold out. And we can just keep what we've got. I mean, that's success today in churches of Christ. Keep what you got. And we need to just hold on to the numbers we got. We considered ourselves successful. I want to change that. My first lesson, I want to show you that evangelism works in your community. Number two, I want to prove to you tonight that you don't have to leave the Bible to be successful. In fact, it's the worst thing you can do. If you want to grow, if you want to see a, a culture that, 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 that focuses every work of the church, not just evangelism isn't just one work, it is the work. I mean, let me be clear. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not categorizing the church into various works. I'm firmly convinced tonight there's one work. It's evangelism. Everything you do ought to funnel through it. Everything you do in this church, I don't care if it's a graduation party. I don't care if it's a, a Easter, uh, excuse me, we don't call it a, a spring party. I don't care if it's a holiday party. I don't care if it's a, if it's a summer camp, a VBS. Evangelism is the funnel right through the middle of it. That's, that's, that's my focus. You don't leave the Bible to make that happen. You don't need a gimmick. You don't need a gadget. You, d you don't need, to, you don't need uh, some modern technology to make it happen. The Bible contains everything you need to make this work. Number three, how do you get into a Bible study? This is by far the favorite lesson of the audience. It's tomorrow morning. I put it intentionally right there in the morning. So you, want, you don't want to miss this because this is how you get your family and your friends and your coworkers into a Bible study. I'm going to give you some things that I'll, almost nothing is 100%. 
but I almost have a 100% success rate. When my family does the things I'm going to teach you in the morning, we get a Bible study almost every single time. I'm going to share that with you, and I get it from Jesus. Now, then we're going to, we're going to introduce a method. It's important that you have one. And so if you don't have a method, you can't do a Bible study. So I'm going to teach you a method that's simple. I can literally teach you how to do it in just minutes. doesn't require weeks and weeks of training. You can sit in the pew tomorrow, and you'll be equipped and trained to use a Bible study method. Then we're going to apply it to the real world. I'm going to show you how evangelism works with day-to-day people. And uh, when you have a problem, how do you respond? When someone asks that question you're not prepared for, what do you say? So we're going to go over the model. Then we're going to divide up into two sections. My wife, Nicole, is going to take the ladies, and she's going to give them the ten ingredients for evangelism. She's going to spell out to the ladies how do you practice the principles. The first five lessons are principle-orientated. There's, there's practice in them, but they're principle-orientated. The last lesson is when we put it into gear. The last lesson is when we give you things to do. I'm going to give the men ten steps. She's going to give the ladies ten ingredients. And then I get to do my favorite session. And you probably won't, you will probably won't be a part of it. It's when I get to sit down with your elders. And if they want the deacons, that's fine. And your preachers. And we lay out the plan. And we get started. And we, we, we put that strategy and we, we get immediately going forward. And so this is going to be an exciting weekend. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to Sunday. I can share with you a, a new lesson, evangelism in the age of COVID. Uh, it's, I'm getting a lot of good response from it. People are asking, well, how, how does COVID affect evangelism? You might be surprised. And then there's one other lesson. And it's what about my family? When, when someone's family is not a member of the church, how does that affect the Bible study? How does it affect me? So you are, we, we're, we're, we're setting the stage for, I hope, an exciting weekend together. So let's go ahead and get motivated. In the year 2000, there were 13,155 churches of Christ in America. In 2009, that dropped to 12,629 churches of Christ. In 2015, it continued there were 12,300 churches of Christ. In 2018, it now went down to 11,965 churches of Christ. I, I'm not going to give you the numbers today. I will Sunday. Let me just tell you what, they're not getting any better. The one, the one trend that we can see in this particular pattern is decline. Churches of Christ are in the decline. Now, I had one person come up to me after I gave these numbers uh, years ago. And they said, oh, preacher, no need to get excited about this. He said, we're not declining. We're just consolidating. We don't need a church in every street corner. We're not living in the horse and buggy era anymore. Churches, little churches are coming together to make big churches. Then explain these numbers. In the year 2000, we had 1,264,000 church members. In the year 2009, 100. 1,224,000 church members. 2015, 1,180,000 church members. 2018, 1,128,000 church members. Brethren, it's, it's pretty obvious. We're losing. We're, we're declining in our membership. In fact, we've been in decline for almost four decades. That is, the Church of Christ has been shedding church members. We have been, we have been, they have been walking out the door. Our churches have been shrinking and if you look at it historically, it's even worse. But I want to give you a little bit of good news. I am trying to get your attention this morning because we cannot afford to punt on this subject any longer. I want to share with you some historical analysis. In 1906, we had a population of this country of 85 million people. We had 159 million members of the church, according to Gospel Advocate. All right, 1946, population of the country, 141 million Members of the Church of Christ, 682,000. Look at the ratio. The first ratio says 1 to 535. Now, let me put that in simple language. That means that you've got to walk across 535 farm fields until you find 535 people at least to find one member of the Church of Christ. Okay, that, that's not a good ratio. The second one, look at this. In 40 years, it, it, it's cut in half. Now you walk across the fields and you come across people, 207. And you find a member of the Church of Christ. But look at the growth. In 1953, 160 million people in this country, members of the Church of Christ, 1.5 million. Now, you got a Christian for every 106 people. Look at 1967, even to the 1970s, 211 million people. 
2.5 million members of the Lord's church. Can you imagine living in a country, a city? Can you imagine walking through Houston and every 84 people you meet is a member of the church of Christ? Wouldn't that be a blessing? Friends, no wonder God blessed America. This nation became the greatest nation on earth because this was a nation of Christians. Well, you, everywhere you looked and everywhere you went, God's people were growing, church buildings were being... Would you know we literally had teams of men who went from place to place, city to city, and their job was to build church buildings. You know the old A-frame church buildings? You know why they're everywhere? Because we just went everywhere and we just built church buildings. Brethren, we were the fastest religious growing body in this country. We grew during World War I. We grew during the Great Depression. We grew during World War II. We grew during... We grew during Korea, Vietnam, the civil rights. The, we grew during the, uh, the feminist movement. We grew during every period of civil unrest this nation has ever seen. The church of Christ triumphed. Until the last two generations. What we have seen the last two generations is inexcusable. We used to be people who carried Bibles carried Bible studies, and we went everywhere doing Bible studies. It defined us. It was the defining moment in, this, in the church of Christ. Something's happened. Because since 1970s, all we have done is decline. We have shed church member after church member after church member. Brethren, let me put this into, into simple language. We're losing, and I hate to lose. And I, I, wish, I, wish, I wish to God... Our brethren would get as excited about losing church members as they do a football game. We get as excited about, we get as motivated from losing a, a church members as a basketball game. You know, last year, do you know what I saw in our brethren? I saw, I saw brethren highly motivated, highly engaged, discussion forums everywhere. And I, I tell you what, the political season was hot. I mean, you couldn't go to a church building, a Vesterville. You couldn't go to somebody's home, and they're talking about the politics. I mean, brethren, they were motivated. They, 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 it was, it was, they were listening. You had your television tuned in. You had your radio tuned in. You were reading every article you could. Can you imagine if we'd be that motivated about evangelism, what would happen? Brethren, it is high time we stop trying to fight a spiritual war through political means. We wrestle not against flesh and blood... Our war is not in, 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 in national physical boundaries. I, I mean, I, I want, I, listen, I want righteous leaders. But I realize that whether or not we win or lose isn't dependent upon who's the president. Brothers and sisters, we're facing a spiritual battle. And the enemy that we're facing is far worse than anything you've got in D.C., let me tell you. He is the great deceiver and he hates you. And if he can use politics to shut you down, he'll use it. If he could discourage you and try to get you back into your church building and lock your door and never come out and, and keep the aquarium and never fish for men, he'll do it. He doesn't want this e seminar. He doesn't want you here. He doesn't want you to hear anything that I've got to say this weekend because he knows if you do, he loses. The question is why? Why are we like this? How we... how? What has happened to the church of Christ in the last 40 years that has caused us to go from the fiery Christians we used to be, teaching the gospel everywhere we went, now to a group of people that are just struggling to keep their doors open. And in some places, we have closed them. And they probably are not going to reopen. I want to give you something that happened in my life that's very personal. But it really changed the way my family looks at this. I've always loved evangelism. But it was this moment that changed my life. It was a phone call. It rang. I picked it up. I'm in the office, just like I always am at Willette. Hello? Uh, is this the preacher? I said, yes, sir. Name's Rob Whitaker. He says, yeah, my name's Chris Coyle. I'm a preacher, too. I said, Chris, nice to meet you. He said, yeah, I, got, I need you to do a Bible study for me. I said, wow. I said, man, anytime a preacher is asked to do a Bible study, that's a celebration. I said, yes, sir. I said, who do you got? He said, he said uh, well, we got this uh, girl, uh, Scarlett, just got married, came a Christian. And uh, she wants someone to do a Bible study with her parents. I said, wow, yes. Who, who, who are they? Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. I said, this is great. I, I write down Jackie and Sheila Birdwell on a piece of paper. And, uh, and uh, I said, that's wonderful. I said, um, uh, when do they expect me? He said, he said, oh, well, we haven't set the date yet. I said, well, it's all right. I'm available. You just tell me what date. When did they request a Bible study? He said, well, 
They haven't yet. I said, okay. Um, I said, Chris, um, what do you expect me to do? Just go up and knock on the door, say, hi, I'm Rob Whitaker. I'm here to do a Bible study. He said, well, he said, I said, how do, you, how do you expect me to get out to them? He says, I don't know. He said, that's your problem now. I'm just relaying a message. And I said, that's the most foolish thing I've heard in a long time. I got off the phone with Chris. I got that piece of paper. I crunkled it up. I put it in the trash waste basket. And I got back to the important things, like during church bulletins. I mean, I got to fold the bulletin. I mean, you know, the brethren, if I don't have a fold the church bulletin, I'd be in trouble. So I got it ready, you know, on Saturday night. I got the bulletin out where it's supposed to be. And I got back in my truck. And I was about to head home. And I stopped. I said, what in the world are you doing, preacher? Get, get back in your office. You can't throw souls away. So I got into my office, you know, and I, I, I unraveled a piece of paper and I put, it, I put it there on my desk and it said Jackie, you know, Sheila Birdwell, and I went home. Man, all I could think about that night was Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. I'm like, what am I going to do? How in the world am I going to get to the, these people? And uh, I thought about through Sunday I'm preaching. I come back to my office on Monday morning. Do you know what was on my desk Monday morning? That piece of paper said Jackie and Sheila Birdwell. <laughs> I said, well, I know, I know one thing I can do. I'm going to pray. It's never wrong to pray, and, 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 and it's always right to pray. So I, I prayed. I, I prayed for wisdom. I prayed for doors of utterance. I, I, I tried to pray for, for um, just opportunities, you know, asking it shall be given. So I'm praying away, and I get done. I said, what else can I do? Well, God can't answer my prayer if I don't do something. I said, well, I'm going to study. You know, when I was a young child, I studied Jesus for the first time. I studied him as the creator of the world. It's a wonderful study. It's in Genesis 1. Every child gets that study from their parents in Bible class. When I was older, I studied Jesus as the Savior of, of, from sin. That's a great study. It results in my salvation. And then when I get a little older, I, I study him as the head of the church. I study him as the Word of God. But I've never studied Jesus as an evangelist. You know, there's never been an evangelist greater than Jesus. He is the greatest Bible study leader, greatest evangelist the world's ever seen. And I've never even studied him. So what I decided to do is break open my Bible and look for Bible studies. Look for the Bible studies of Jesus. And I'm going to write down characteristics of his studies. Things I see that are consistent. And here's what I learned. I learned that the things that Jesus did consistently, I didn't do them. And I learned the things I thought made me successful, he didn't do those. And I began to realize that my approach is nothing like the Lord's. And I've got to make some changes I was sitting in my office. I did this study for months, and then Jonathan Smith comes home from college. He, he walks into my office, say, man, Rob, I'm back, and, and I graduated. I met this young girl at Carnes Church across Knoxville, and I'm going to get married, and I'm going to get a job here as a teacher, and we're just talking, and, and he said, no, Rob, I got to go. I said, where are you heading, Jonathan? He said, well, I'm going to go visit my best friend. I said, well, who is it? Evan Birdwell. Evan Birdwell. Evan Birdwell. I said, Jonathan, is Evan Birdwell related to Jackie and Sheila Birdwell? He said, oh, yeah, Rob, that, that's, like my, that's like my second parents. I mean, yeah, that's their son. I said, well, man, take me with you. He said, well, take, what do you mean? He said, you don't know. I said, I know, but you're going to introduce me. I said, one rule, don't tell him I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ. The only thing you got, just I'm your friend. He said, are you sure? I said, hey, let's, get, let's get going. I got in the car, you know, and I, I had a strategy. I don't shoot from the hip. When I do Bible studies, I have an A to Z strategy in my head. I know, I know where I'm going. I know what I want to do. When we get to that house, Johnson opens the door. He knocks. Sheila comes through. Jonathan. Oh, my Jackie, it's Jonathan. He's home. Right. You know, I mean, it was like a lost son had come home. They grabbed him. They're hugging him. Come on. In. Oh, man, Evan's not home. But come on. Who's with you? Oh, that's just a friend of mine. Right? Well, any friend of Jonathan's a friend of mine. Come on in, you know. Like any good southern woman, she had chocolate chip cookies and sweet tea. And we sat around the table, you know, we just talked a little bit. And uh, 10, 15 minutes passed by, and all of a sudden, there was the awkward moment. Who, who'd, you, who'd, you say that, who, who'd you say you are? I said, oh, well, Sheila, my name is Rob Whitaker. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ, and you've got questions for me. I sure do. Jackie, the preacher, I sure do got lots of questions for you. Boy, I tell you, I've been waiting. And I mean, they just flew off her tongue. So fluid. It's like she had practiced the questions. I mean, one right after the I got a strategy. Never used it before. I'm using it this time. I will not answer questions. I'm going to defer every question she throws at at me. So I, I, I defer every one. I circle it back around. doesn't matter what she says, I'm not answering. I defer every... I did this for five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. And, and finally she figures it out. She goes, Jackie, why won't that preacher answer my questions? And, and, uh, and uh, I, said, I said, Sheila, that's a great observation. 
I said, I tell you what, um, you know, I'm not a very good uh, teller. I don't tell things, but I'm, I'm pretty good showing. I said, if you'll let me show you, I think you'll find an answer. She says, you, you, you mean in the Bible? I said, well, yeah, you have to read the Bible. Jackie, can we do a Bible study with a preacher for the Church of Christ? Jackie looks over at his wife. said, now, Sheila, I don't think it's ever wrong to study the Bible. And I said, well, I said, hey, she said, well, I, I tell you what you need to do. She said, she said, I'll do this study with you, preacher, but it's got to be a secret study. No one can know. And I said, well, I said, well, I said, I make a counter proposal to you. I said, how, how, about, I, how about I tell just our elders and have them pray? Because I think prayer is important when you study the Bible. Well, she said, who are these men? I said, well, Joe Lynn, Hugh Wayne Clark, Hugh Clark. Well, I know those men. Those are good men. You can tell them. Tell them not to tell anyone. They'd excommunicate me if they knew I was doing this. I said, okay. I didn't know what that meant. But she, you know, and, and I said, all right. I said, what day you want me to come back? We set the appointment. I, I, I went home. I, I was so excited. I told my, my family. I told Jared and Hannah, Nicole. I said, this is exactly what I was waiting for. I said, I'm going to try what I've been learning. And, and, and I got into the pulpit. I, I'm going to try something else. I'm going to announce Bible studies from the pulpit. I'm going to talk about Bible studies. When, when there's a Bible study going on, we're going to talk about it. Now, I can't give them the name, but we're going to pray about it. We're going to pray about this study. I'm going to keep the church updated about how it's going. So, so I, get, I get out there on Monday evening with Jonathan, and I knock on that door, you know. and She, she opens up, and we come on in, and we sit down. Now, I said, now, Sheila and Jackie, I got these little booklets. Green, we're going to go to John 8, 30. Rob, I said, yes, ma'am. She says, now, before we get started, there's something important that I need to tell you. I said, okay. She said, I need to tell you about my religious experience. I said, well, I said, let me get a pen. So I got my pen out and I got my paper and I was, I was, I was going to write down. She said, now, Rob, it was a late and stormy night and the lightning was coming and the thunder was crackling and, and it was, so I couldn't even see on the road. Rob, and something happened. The lightning struck a tree, caught on fire, went over the road. And Rob, I was about to die and I, I just closed my eyes and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit took over the card and... You don't believe me, do you? And I said, well, she lied. I said, if that's what you said happened, I'm writing it down right now. She said, then the Holy Spirit took over and, and swerved me into the road. And I got down in the culvert. And she says, and there I got the feeling. My whole, I could feel the Holy Spirit. She said, I knew I was saved. But I had to go to the church and testify. And I told the church all about my religion. And they voted on me. And they said I was saved that night. And a month later, we had a mass baptism. And I joined the church. I said, uh, is that all there is? She says, Yes. And you believe me, don't you? I said, well, Sheila, if that's what you said happened, I'm writing it down. She said, well, I thought you should know that before we go any further. And I said, well, Sheila, would it be okay if we looked at John 8, 32? She said, well, sure. I said, well, let's open our Bibles. We opened our Bibles and we began. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And we, we began to fill out the little booklet together and Jackie's filling it out. I mean, they know their books of the Bible. I don't even have to help them. John, Jonathan is looking to help them. He doesn't have to help them. I mean, you can tell. They're, they're students of the Bible. We're going through the entire study. Rob, man, I learned some things tonight. I didn't, I didn't understand this old New Testament stuff you just taught us. And, and I've been teaching Bible class all these years. And uh, he said, there's some things you need to know about Sheila and I, Rob. I said, okay, Jackie. And he said, now listen. He said, he said I'm a missionary Baptist. I don't, I don't know what that means. And I said, okay. And he said, now, Rob, he says, I'm the deacon. I said, well, that must be important, you know. And, I said, and so he said, I'm also the treasurer. Now we're getting pretty important. I mean, he's, he's got the money. He said, he said, and I teach their adult Bible class. Very involved. I said, okay, Jackie. He said, I noticed something tonight. He said, while you were doing this study, he said, you never skipped one verse. He said, you just accepted whatever the Bible said. And I said, Jackie, that's all I do. He says, you know, there's sometimes, Rob, when I'm doing a Bible class and I look at a verse, either I don't understand it or we don't do it. He says, that's always bothered me. He's an honest man. That's important. I said, Jackie, I said, I, I appreciate you. She said, now, Rob, you need to know about me, too. I said, yes, Sheila. What, what, what? She said, I teach Bible class. I said, good. She, and she said, I started the Bible class department at my church. And she said, there was no Bible class department for my children. And I started it up. And she said, and all my family, mama, grandmama, aunt, we're all members there. I said, well, I'm glad you shared it with me. I said, well, can I come back and do another study? She said, well, I'd like to know more about this. I said, all right, let's set the date. So I come back the next night, we go, or the next week, and we, we lay out the blue booklet, book two, and we're going to go over the kingdom of God, the church of Christ. And we lay it out, and we, we start, to, you know, we start filling out the various uh, parts of the booklet. And, uh, and uh, I know there are things they're learning that night directly contradict what they believe. I know it. Here's what I 
Here's what I find very, very interesting. They always put the right answer down. In fact, at one point, I looked at Jackie. I said, Jackie, are you sure you have no questions about this? He said, Rob, if it's in the Bible, I'll put it down. I mean, You've got to respect honest people. So we're, we're going to the end of the study. I mean, they're, I mean they're, they're taking everything the Bible says. I said, man, this is great. So I get home. I tell my kids all about it. I tell the church all about it. And, um, man, i got to know more. So I, I called Chris, and I got, got the number for Scarlett. And I called Scarlett. I said, Scarlett, my name is Rob Whitaker. I'm studying with you. You're studying with my mama. I said, guess what? Do you think she's going to obey the God? I said, Scarlett, I don't know. She talked to me for 30 minutes. Couldn't get a word in. She is so, ex- she is so worked up and excited. And I understand. I mean, this is her mom and dad. And, and I said, Scarlett, I need to know, I need to know why, you, why you converted. Like, tell me what, what was it that you learned that caused you to lead the Missionary Baptist Church and become become a Christian. What, what, what was it? And she said, well, she, she, she told me this long, there were two things she said I'll never forget. I'm going to share one now and one later. She said, Rob, when I went to my parents after that study, she said, I knew what I had to do. I said, Mom, Dad, this is what I'm going to do. And uh, they said, now, Scarlett, you know if you do this, we'll have to excommunicate you. And uh, I said, excommunicate? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, she said, that means the deacons are coming. The deacons? Who are the deacons? Well, see, they're going to bring the briefcase. Well, why did they bring the, what's in the briefcase, Scarlett? Well, she said, now I had my Bible, Rob. She said, they were going to come in my house, and she said, I'm going to do a I'm going to defend my faith, and I'm going to show my parents why I did what I did. I said, that's great. What did they bring? The briefcase. And in, inside there's a tablet. I said, what's in the tablet? She said, church roster. She said, they took the eraser, they found my name, they identified me, Scarlet, that is Scarlet. They erased my name off the church roster. I said, what did they do next? They put it in the briefcase. I said, what did they do with the brief? They left. I said, Scarlett, what, was there a prayer offered? Was there anything said? No, just I'm no longer a member. My mother was livid. She looked over at Jackie after that meeting. She says, you mean they're not even going to try to win her back? What kind, of, what kind of church are we going to, Jackie? I said, that is the strangest thing I've ever heard. And uh, so I'm, I'm going into the house Thursday. Jonathan and I, in our last study, read booklet. Right before I walk inside, Jackie says, now, Sheila, you know that little preacher's coming tonight, and he thinks he's going to baptize us. He says, I've been a Baptist all these years. I'm going to die a Baptist. And Sheila says, oh, that's good, Jackie. She said, Mama was a Baptist. Grandmama was a Baptist. Aunt so-and-so's a Baptist. And she says, I'm going to die a Baptist. He says, good, I'm glad we've got that covered. And then I knocked on the door, and we read the Bible. You know, something happens to people when they read the Bible. See, I, I, I wasn't going, I don't want them to be converted to Rob. I want them to be converted to God, and they got to read the Bible. So we started reading that Bible, and they, they laid it open, and they're, 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 they're filling out the booklets, and we get, we get the faith, no problems, repentance, we got it, confession, we got, we got the baptism, I knew it was a challenge. So I, I got my, my charts out there. I got some charts in that little simplified booklet, and I laid them out on the table. They're actually in Back to the Bible, book three. And I, I put them out there. I said, now, Jackie, let's go over every part of this. And I laid it out. We read the scriptures. And you know what the problem was that night? He got it. He saw it. His eyes started to water. His hands were shaking. He wouldn't look at me anymore. I said, I, I, I don't normally do this. I called for the invitation. I said, Jackie, I said, uh, I said you got it. I mean, look at me. I said, Jackie, what are you going to do with what you've just learned? And he looked up and he says, uh, he said, Rob, I know exactly what I've got to do and we're going to do it. She looks, Jackie, what are you talking? Jack, Jack, Jackie, you said we weren't going to do that. He looked over at his wife and he said, Sheila, we have no choice. It's what the Bible says. She hit him in his gut and he leaned over. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I said, Jackie, let's go. My car, yours. Let's get out there right now. He said, now, Rob, I can't do it tonight. Man, the, he's so, the devil's so relentless. He never gives up. I said, man, this isn't good. I said, I, said, I got I to get, because I know that the devil doesn't want this to happen. He's, he's, he's the deceiver, the delayer. And I said, okay, uh, James 4, life is a vapor, you know. And I said, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, you know, today's the day of salvation. I, I'm thinking, uh, you know, what, ver, uh, what verses can I use uh, to help him see the urgency, you know, same hour of the night. Almost thou persuadest me. Wouldn't budge. 
about this time, I'm getting a little concerned. I said, Jackie, I said, I mean, what happens if you die? What are you waiting on? And he said, Rob, you don't get it. I hold the bag. I said, the what? The bag, Rob. Rob, I got all the money for this church in my house. He said, Rob, I've got to repent. I've got to give it back. Man, that bothered me. I didn't understand why he'd wait. He said, but Rob, you can come to my house every day until we do it. And I did. Oh, I did. I was sitting in my office one day years later, and I, I, that always, always bothered me, that part of the story. And I was reading Matthew 7, and where Jesus says, Bring ye therefore fruits worthy of repentance. You know, it's not hard for a 15-year-old boy to repent, but it's awfully hard for a 55-year-old man who's lived in religious error all his life. He needed to make some changes, and he did. We came every day. Every day I sat in that swing. We swung back and forth. And my kids came and they picked. Now, we had more garden vegetables than I knew what to do with. And, 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 and man, we did. Jackie, is the day the day? He said, no, not yet, Rob, but it's getting close. I was sitting in the back of the auditorium. We had about 225, 30 people that night. It's Wednesday night. And uh, I'm just talking to Jill. She's one of the ladies' sisters there, one of the deacon's wives. And, and uh, Rob. That's Jackie and Sheila Birdwell walking in our church. I said, it is. Rob, is that them? Is that the couple you've been studying with? I said, yes, it is. She said, Rob, I, I, I can't believe it. And there it is. We don't believe. Brother, we don't believe this works. Yeah, in Jamaica, sure. Yeah, go to India and Africa. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll baptize hundreds and thousands. It don't work in this country. Maybe a children, benevolence from time to time. But, you know, evangelism doesn't work in America anymore. You ought to have seen that church that night when the Wednesday night invitation was given. And Jackie and Sheila just popped up from the, uh, from the pews right about this side. And they started walking forward that night. That church wept. I could hear the sniffles coming out of the members People were trying to fight back their tears because they saw something happen they thought was impossible. And we baptized them into Christ that night. You know, just a few months later, Jackie's sitting behind the pulpit during the Wednesday night invitation. That changed the will at Church of Christ, and that changed how we did evangelism. I knew I'd found something. I got to develop it. Because I, I, there's something going on here, and I, I've, got to, I've got to start working it, Rob. I've got to focus on this, because there's something that happened in that study. I did something different. I'd never done it before. And from that day forward, I've done nothing but try to develop this. He's going to be my next one. His name's Evan. That's their son. I said, Jackie, I said, man, we've got we to gotta study with Evan, your son. Now, Rob, uh, Evan doesn't quite work like that. I said, what do you mean work like that? Of course he does. I said, we've got to study with him. He said, now, Rob, um, he says, now, Evan's kind of different. What difference does that make? You know, I mean, he needs a Bible study. And he said, now, hey, Jack, Sheila is listening to the conversation. Sheila said, uh, Jackie, now, I said, I tell you what, why don't we do the backdoor approach? Well, we'll t you know, you can just sit down and say, now, son, let me explain to you what your sister's done, what I've done, your mother's done. He, he said, Rob, it won't work. Sheila said, yes, it will, Jackie Bird. Well, now, Rob, get over there and talk to Evan. Now, Rob, yeah, Rob. I listened to Sheila, you know. I went over there and talked to Evan. Evan and I would talk from time to time. He likes my airplane stories. I'm a pilot, and I, I'll tell stories, illustrating things. And he loved it. He'd always stop and listen, you know, when I do. So I just walked right over to Evan, you know. I said, Evan, I said, uh, I said uh, you, your family, you got, got a lot of changes going along. He said, yes, yeah, yes. I said, Let, I said can, can I talk to you about it? He looked at me. I don't want to talk about it. And I ended that conversation right there. I said, well, I, I blew it there. Um, I never give up on people. So I'm thinking the entire, how can I get to Evan? How can I get to Evan? Airplane. Evan, would you like to go flying with me? Me? I said, yeah. Where would you, if you could go flying anywhere, where would you go? Del Hall Lake. I understand it's an old city. They flooded when they dammed it up. And you can see it. I said, you can in a clear day. He said, would you take me? I said, Absolutely. We take off from the airport, get up to about five. Brethren, you can baptize anybody at 5,000 feet, let me tell you. We get up there, five, I got his undivided attention. Man, we're sitting there flying. I even let him fly a little bit. We flew around Dale Hall Lake, came back three Mike 7 and landed. And uh, man, it, this is his day. I looked at Evan. I said, Evan, I said, you pick where you want to eat my treat. Really? There's only a subway. He said, why don't we go to Subway? I said, sounds good to me. So we, we run over to Subway and we sit down at the table and we're just chatting back and forth and Evan, 
could I talk to you a little bit about Jesus? He says, don't want to talk about Jesus. And I'm like, what in the world? I was about to give up and he caught me. He said, but Rob, when I'm ready, you'll be the first to know. I said, I'll take that. Some time had elapsed, months, several months had elapsed, and I get this phone call. Nicole and I are at Bible camp, and we don't get cell reception out there almost at all, very little. And uh, my phone rang. Hello? Rob? Uh, This is Amy. Who in the world is Amy? Rob, this is, yes. Um, I've read a book. I think I'm going to hell. Will you do a Bible study with me? I said, what? I said, what? Who? Who? I'm sorry, who in the world? Oh, Amy, Evan's girlfriend. Yes. I said, Amy, what book have you read? Um, Scarlet, that's Evan's sister, gave me muscle and a shovel. She had me, Rob, I think I'm going to hell. I, I need to st- talk to you. I said, well, man, Amy, I said, because as soon as I get home, I will. He said, she says, that's good. She says, Rob, I only have one condition. I said, well, you name it. Got to do the study with Evan, too. I said, well, Amy, Evan doesn't want to do the study. She says, I know that's your problem now. How does this keep happening to me? And I, I, I talk to myself. I, I'm thinking, I said, I got it. Mama's cooking. Mama's cooking always solves problems. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, you tell Miss um, Sheila to make Evan's favorite dinner on Sunday. I'm going to be back. And I said, invite us over and make sure he knows that we're doing a Bible study together. He'll stay. Guarantee. She said, oh, that's a great plan. I said, yes. She said, I'm going to tell Scarlett. Scarlett drives all the way from Freed Hardman. She's, she's, she's married. She's living close to Freed Hardman. Her, her husband's an air traffic controller at Memphis Center. So they, he, she comes all the way back. She sits at the table. She just wants to witness this event. So, so we're all sitting there talking. We finished the supper, and I pull out. I just so happen to have those booklets. I just pull out those booklets. I said, well, let's, let's do these together. Evan sees it and says, huh, uh-uh. He got up from the table. He walked out, got in his Mustang, and drove off. Amy is just devastated. She's crying. Tears are rolling out. Nicole's, you know, trying to, trying to console her. And, uh, and, and Scarlett, I cannot believe my brother. Now, I tell you what, you talk about a mad mama. Sheila's back there at the kitchen. You know, she's washing dishes. I can't believe my son. You know, I, how did he do that? Why would he do that? And then there's Jackie sitting at the easy chair, you know, reading the newspaper. I told y'all this wouldn't work. <laughs> I said, what a day. Uh, um, I tell you what, uh, um, Amy, why don't we just do the study? She said, I know, Mr. Rob. And I said, Nicole, let's get the booklets out. And we, we pass them out. And we start John 8, 32. We start right at John 8, 32. We start, start we're John 17, 17, John 4. He opened the back door and he walked right inside. He sat right at the table. Scarlett is so excited to see her brother Evan. She said, now, Evan, you'll need this book, uh, this Bible. He says, I don't want the Bible. Okay. And uh, now, now Amy said, now, we're filling out this little book. I don't want the booklet. I just want to listen. And I said, all right. I said, just let him listen, you know. So he's listening. By the end of the study, he's answering the questions. I think I know what the problem is. And I... They walk out of the house, and I look over at Scarlett. I said, Scarlett, I said, your mother, your father, your brother, they, they can never repay what you've done. Go home. Your brother will not do this in front of you. And I said, in fact, I said, we're going to have them to our home. We did the next week. Nicole made one of her beautiful suppers. Hannah made her desserts. We sat down and ate, passed out back to the Bible. He took it. He answered it, and he is extremely intelligent. He, he, he gets all the questions right. We're, I mean, I am so excited about this study because I can see it in my mind until somebody told me something about him. And now I don't know what to do. I'm not going to finish this story right now because there's a lesson that I need you to learn and I'm going to be in lesson five. So I'm going to skip it right now. Let's go to Ed Goolsby. Ed Goolsby, he lives across the street. He's, a, he's an old, kind of, he's just an old uh, He's an old guy. Um, he's a little cranky. And, and when I moved in uh, to the church, a parsonage over there, the elders said, now, Rob, they said, now, whatever you do, don't bother Ed Goolsby. Don't knock on his door. Don't just leave him alone. I said, all right, no problem. I, I won't bother Ed Goolsby. So, so I didn't think it'd be, you know, we're unpacked. I got a dog. Name is Rue. Rue is a bird dog. A hunting dog chases anything that moves. Uh, uh, you can't chain this dog up. Guys, do y'all know about the invisible fence? It's an amazing invention. Put the collar on, shot collar, lay the fence out. I mean, I said, I got it. So I went to Lowe's and got this. I said, man, I've I've solved the problem. Men love to fix things. I have fixed everything. 
then I read the directions. Take six weeks to train dog. I don't have six weeks. I have six minutes. I just turned the thing on maximum power. She'll learn. So we, we start moving in. Dog's running around. She sees deer dart out the back of the yard. Root takes off. She hits the perimeter. It lays her out. She's a shaking like this, you know. Ah, yeah, okay. And the kids, dad, she, dad, the dog. And she's, I mean, highest pitch sound a dog can make. Dad, the dog's going to die. And I said, no, the dog isn't going to. Leave the dog alone. It stops. The dog runs under the house of Ed Goolsby. And she is yelping as loud as she can yelp. And I said, oh, man. So I walked over and I knocked on the door. And, and as, as soon as I knocked, yes, can I help you? I said, oh, yes, sir. Um, my name is Rob. I know who you are. I said, oh, okay, sir. Um, um, sir, my, uh, my name is Rob. My dog, did you shoot your dog? I said, oh, no, sir. I said, I would not do that. I said, can I retrieve my dog? He said, go get your dog. And so my children get out, you know, get under the house. And they're, what an excellent evangelistic opportunity this is. Ed, I'm the new preacher. Will at Church of Christ name. I told you I knew who you were. And if I need you, I'll let you know. He slammed the door so hard, I thought it was coming out of the frame. And uh, not a good first impression. Um, I never give up on people. My mission now is to have a Bible study with Ed Goolsby, and I won't stop until I get it. And I thought of everything I could. One day we're doing a little passing out uh, house to house in the community, and I, I, I called on James and Glenda York. They're new Christians. James works with Ed at the volunteer fire department. I said, hey, James, you pass house to house out to Ed. He said, why not you, Rob? I said, oh, no, you pass it out. I said, he knows you. He said, okay. So I'm going a totally different direction. Phone ring. Hello? Hey, hey, James, what's going on? Rob, Ed wants to see you right now. I said, oh, no. I said, I'll be right there. Where are we at? He says, he's coming over to the church building to see you. And I said, this isn't going to be good. So I go over to the church building. I walk in. Ed's sitting on a chair. He looks up at me and tears are streaming down of his eyes. I said, Ed, you okay? He said, no, I'm not, Rob. My doctor says, I have cancer. Can you teach me about the Bible? I said, I'd be glad to. Never give up on people. And he was baptized. This is Charles, Mary, and Barry Hunt. You don't see their son. He's an older son, and, and he, still, he lives at home and helps his parents. And, and uh, Charles is a city manager. Now, we got hollers out there in, 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 in Tennessee. I, I don't see any hollers here. Now, in central Texas, you got hollers. Hollers are kind of big hills in between. There's a valley, and you've got to walk up and down them. And the girl, some of the ladies are passing out house to house. And they see the big house on the, on the hill. Got ferocious dogs. I mean, they bark, scary dogs. Melanie sees them, Betty sees them, and they're, they're lunging at them. And Betty says, oh, Melanie says, this morning, you know, when Rob was training us, he says it's still okay to observe the Old Testament Passover. It's a good time to observe it now. Let's pass right on over. We'll go to the next house. And uh, Melanie said, well, you can't do that. This could be the one, you know. And so they gingerly start walking up the door. Charles peeps out the window. Mary, the Jehovah Witnesses are back. I'm ready for them this time, Mary. Don't worry. And he said, oh, boy, here they come again. They will not get past me this time. Mary, get ready. Watch this, Mary. I've got them now. And, and Betty knocks on the door. He opens up and says, hey. He said, house to house is here. He said, hey, hey, Mary, Mary, come on in. Y'all come on in. <laughs> Melanie and Betty don't know what to do. They gingerly walk in the house and sit on the couch and uh, and uh, man, we are so glad you, we read this publication every month you send it. We, 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 all, we, we enjoyed the Bible scripture in it. And we, this is wonderful. We love it. And uh, Betty said, what, what, oh yeah, Rob said to do this. Um, would you like to know more about the church? Oh, I sure would. Oh no. Um, 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 when would you like to do it? He said, right now. She says, oh no. Oh, um, um, where would you like to do it? Oh, here at your church. Fine. Doesn't matter to me. She says, can you excuse me? She gets up, walks out of the house, and calls me. I said, what in the world, Betty? Hello? Uh, hey, Rob? I said, yes, Betty, what's going on? She said, Rob, I've got a hot one here, and I don't know what to do. And I said, a hot one? I said, what do you, you? She said, Rob, they want it now. And I said, bring them to the church building. You know, this coming. So, so they bring them up, three, three adults, bring them right into the church building. We sit down. I said, Nicole? I said, I've never seen anything like this. I said, does it matter? The one study method. I said, I may never see this family again. And we started. We had open Bibles. They knew their Bible. Didn't have to show them where John was. Didn't have to show them where Mark was. I mean, they're religious. You can tell they've gone to church all their life. They're, they're enjoying it. I mean, they're smiling until we get to baptism. Mary gets the mono brow. She pierces her lips. She forms a fist, and she hits the table, and she pushes off, and her chair rolls 10 feet. 
I said, Charles, what's going on? He says, I don't know, but I'll find out. He walks over. I looked over at Nicole. I said, I don't think this is going to end well. And uh, they come back. I said, uh, Charles, what's wrong? He says, Mary's angry. So I could see. Um, and uh, he says, uh, Rob, uh, we've been going to church all our life, you know. I said, at, that, at this church, I said, okay. I said, well, what's going on? He said, our pastor told us we didn't have to be baptized. He says, but the Bible says we do. And we want to know why they've lied to us all these years. Why have they been telling us this? Because it says he that believes and is baptized. I said, Charles, I have no idea. But I know how we can fix it. And we did. And we baptized all three of them. This is Ronnie Rhodes. He's literally sat in our pews for 25, 30 years. I just ask a simple question one day. I says, has anybody ever done a Bible study with Ronnie Rhodes? No. Afraid we might lose him. He'll be no worse off, I promise. So I just decided I'm going to do a Bible study with Ronnie Rhodes. I went to his house. He's going to have surgery. I said, you know, he sees me at church. So right, come on in, Rob. You know, and I came on in. We just started talking. I, I started complimenting his woodwork. And, man, he's really talented. And we're just like, Ronnie, have, have you, you know, you've been going to this church a long time. He says, yeah, I have. I said, would it be okay if I told you a little bit about the things that we're wanting to do here? He said, well, sure. I said, why not if you come to my house like on Tuesday night and my wife makes you a big dinner? Well, that'd be great. All he needed was a Bible study. It's amazing what happens when people read their Bibles. We don't tell them, you know. But when they open their Bibles and actually do a Bible study, I mean, people, you never thought they would obey the gospel, obey the gospel. And then, and then there's Jerry Conley. I just got to Jacksonville a few years ago. Alan Webster is the preacher. I looked at Alan. I said, hey, Alan. I said, when I'm home, which isn't often, I said, I want to practice what I preach. I can't teach everybody else how to do something I don't do. I said, give me a list of everybody that sits in your pews that's not a Christian. He gave me the list. I said, top of the list. Said, Jerry, I said, can you take me to Jerry Conley's house? He said, sure would. One Monday, he, he picked me up at my house. We drove on out to Jerry Conley's house. Jerry Conley's got an old house. Didn't know anything about it. He opens the door and said, hey, Alan, uh, this is our new member, Rob. I said, well, man, nice to meet you. Well, come on in, you know. He starts telling me about the history of Alabama. He tells me that this house was originally, this is his location where the original governor's house was going to be. And the actual capital of Alabama was, and he's got the life history story of this. And he, he shows me original doorknobs. No, this is an old, he's restored, he's in his 70s. Guys, he got more, I mean, I don't know how he's doing to him and his wife, Ella Sue. And I mean, they're just, I mean, he, I said, Jerry? My, my family needs to know this history. Can I bring them back? All I want is a Bible study. I could care less about the history of Alabama. He said, well, yeah, sure, bring them on back. So, so the next week, I got my family. We got in the car. We came out there to Jerry Conley's. Knocked on, you know, come on in, you know. And he's telling me about the original word work and, and then crown molding and doorknobs and floor. <laughs> Jerry, is that apple pie? He said, Ellis, who's made you wonder? I said, well, man, I locked up. I'm coming on in. You know, we, eh, preachers love to eat. We get into the kitchen, you know, and now she's got ice cream. It's not bluebell, but I'll, I'll eat it. And, um, you know, so, so I, I get the ice cream. Jerry, you've been coming to the church here at Jacksonville. How long? Oh, a year or two, Rob. I said, okay. I said, uh, have you ever been to a church of Christ before? Not really. Went to a Baptist church in Illinois. I said, okay. I said, Jerry. Could I tell you a little bit about the church here? Oh, yeah. I just so happened to have these books. Nicole, John 8, 32. I said, uh, we, we've got these booklets right here. And he said, okay. I said, let's get our Bibles. And Jerry didn't know he was lost because he'd never studied his Bible. It's one thing to tell a man, but it's a whole different matter when a person reads their Bible. I tell you what, I've never seen a man drive faster than the baptistry to Jerry Conley. I couldn't keep up. I didn't think we were going to make it. Nothing more powerful than a Bible study. Someone says, Rob, why, why are you like this? What, what, are you, what are you trying to get at? Well, let me tell you one more piece of information, and then we're going to take a break. When I was young, and um, uh, I grew up in Bull Verde, Texas. I'm a Texas brother. I mean, I tell you, it's so good to be back in Texas where barbecue is beef, where Mexican food is Tex-Mex, where tortillas don't have a half-life, and ice cream is bluebell. I love this state. I mean, it's so good to be back. And so, so, so I, I grew up in, in just north of San Antonio. I grew up, we had a little, little, little ranch and arena and barn and goat and hay and, and, and horses. And um, man, I, I was bored, you know, nothing to do out there. So, so I, I said, Mom, I'm bored. She said, well, go make a friend. And I did. 
I just walked up the street, knocked on the door. Mel Hutzler answered, best friend. We did everything together. And um, I said, Dad, I said, uh, Mel, in his house, he's got these statues everywhere, crosses, you know, uh, Mary, I think. W what is he doing that, with all that? Uh, Rob, he's Catholic. I said, well, what does that mean? He explained it. I said, okay, Dad, I want him to be Christian. Then teach him. And I did. I'm not very good at it. I just asked questions like, Mel, um, why does the Bible say you need to go down into the water and uh, you got sp sprinkled? I don't know, Rob. I said, Mel, um, why does the Bible say call no man your father and um, you call your priest father? Don't know. Mel, why is your church not in the Bible? I don't know. Mel, why did the first Pope Peter get married? I don't know. And those were the questions I'd ask. I'm not very good at this. But I'm good enough that after seven years, Mel walked into my bedroom and said, Rob, I need to talk to you. I said, what's going on? He says, you know, I've been going to church with you for a while. I said, yes. He said, I've been, I've been reading. I said, yes. Rob, I want to be a Christian. I said, man, this is, that was one of the greatest days of my life. I said, I was so excited. I hugged him. And man, I, I said, Mel, this is wonderful. He said, yeah. He says, and I said, mom, dad, Mel wants to be a Christian. And they're talking to him. And, and then it was just, I'm, I'm, such a, I'm such a high, you know. And we sit down and Mel said, oh, I, I just have one problem. I said, well, what is it? He said, you got to tell my dad. I said, your, your dad? I said, well, well, sure. I said, he said, Rob, you got to tell. I said, mom, dad, I'll be back. We're going to convert Mel's dad. This won't take long. So we, we got in the car and we drove down to the house. And, and uh, we, we, Mr. Hutzler is sitting on one end of the table. I'm sitting, his dad is a violent man. I'm scared of him. But not that day, I wasn't. I just, I didn't have it. I, I was just. I was just going to ask him about Bible things. And he sat down on one end, I, and, and he said, what do you got to tell me? I said, sir, I said, uh, he said I, I've been studying the Bible with Mel, and I tried to use the same tactics I did with Mel's dad with Mel. Didn't work very well. In fact, his dad got angrier and angrier every second that passed. The more I read the Bible, the more angry the man got. In fact, he finally just put his fist in the table. He said, that's enough of that. You'll, be not, you'll not say one more word in this house. And he grabbed his wallet and threw it at me like a fastball. Barely missed. And he said, he said, get out of this house. He said, I better never see you again. I don't want you to ever see my son again. Don't come in this house. You're never to speak to him again. Get out. His dad is a violent man. He's coming towards me. Mel grabs me. He picks me up. And he literally carries me out of the house. Mel's a big guy. He says, Rob, get out. My dad will hurt you. And I'm shaking. I am so scared. And I'm just an 18-year-old kid, you know, and. And I, I didn't, I said, I said, Mel, what happened? He said, I don't know, Rob. He said, uh, he said, Rob, you got to go, 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 get, get out. And I, tears are starting to pour out of my eyes. I said, but Mel, he said, Rob, get out, go. He said, we'll talk about this later. And I got home and I curled into the arms of my mother and I just cried. I said, mom, what happened? What did I do wrong? She said, son, and they tried to console me and talk to me and I, 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 I was so upset and, and, um, the doorbell rang at 9 o'clock that night, and uh, we went to the door. Dad, that's unusual out there. So we opened it. he opens the door, and on the other side of the door is Mel Hutzler with two suitcases in his hands. Mr. Whitaker, my dad says I can be a Catholic or stay at home, or I can become a Christian, and i got to leave. Mr. Uh, Whitaker, I choose the Lord, and I have no place to live. And my mother grabbed him and hugged him and said, son, as long as you're, you're, we're in this house, this room is yours. And she pointed to it, that's your house. And uh, Mel moved in. He's my brother. And um, I, I had two ways to get into the Boverde. I chose the long way. I would not drive past Mel's house. One day I was at work at Albertsons. I was stocking groceries. Mel runs back and says, Rob, my dad's here looking for you. Don't let him find you. It was tense. I'll tell you, it was tense. And uh, I kept telling Mel, Mel, you've got to make things right with your dad. Somehow make peace. Got, got to do it. And he said, he still hasn't obeyed the gospel. And uh, one day, my dad sat down with Mel, and they, and they, they talked. And, 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 and Mel went to talk to his dad. And he came back to that. He said, listen, Mr. Whitaker, my dad says I can go home. We said, Mel, that's good. He said, here's the condition. i got to do a Bible study with a monsignor. I said, monsignor? What's a monsignor? One level up from a Catholic priest. I said, man, this is great. We're going to convert the whole Catholic church. I said, man, Mel, get your Bibles. We're going to And we studied every verse of the Bible. I said, we're memorizing. we got to underline it. I mean, this is wonderful. Every day we work. The day of the study, I got the stomach bug. I said, man. I said, uh, Mel, reschedule. He said, Rob, I, oh, 
I didn't know how to tell you this. He says, but my dad said, I must do this study alone. I said, no, you can't go up against a monsignor by yourself. And he said, I won't be. And he held his Bible. He says, I got everything I need. Mel drove over to that. That monsignor came all the way from San Antonio, Texas. His dad is a big giver. He drives up, gets into the priest's office. Mel walks into the priest's office, and he sits down. He said, he said, now, Mr. Monsignor, he said, I've been doing these Bible studies. And he says, listen, he said, if you can just explain to me why the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water, why we can spread. He said, now, stop, you stop quoting that book to me. But he said, Mr. Monsignor, in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 38, they went down into the water. Now, he said, I told you, son, to stop quoting that book to me. But Mr. Monsignor, he said, now, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 30, he said, son, give me that book. And he grabbed the Bible out of Mel's hand, and he put it on the table. He said, son, I told you, stop quoting me that book. I'm the Monsignor. And it's my job to tell you what it says. And I'll interpret it for you. And by the way, we just don't go by the Bible. We go by the Bible and tradition. Mel grabbed that Bible out of his hand. He said, as far as I'm concerned, this Bible study is over. And he walked right out. That next Sunday at the Northern Oaks Church of Christ, where Daryl Conley was my preacher, Mel walked forward. And the church cried because they saw a young man love his heavenly father more than his earthly father, and he was baptized. I saw to my wife today, he is my best friend. He is the most courageous man I've ever met. Years later, the Northern Oaks Church of Christ called him and said, Mel, would you be our preacher? We went to preaching school together. That photo was taken at the graduation at Southwest School of Bible Studies. He preaches today at the Northern Oaks Church of Christ, and every year we do mission work together. If you've not met Mel Hutzler, you need to. One of the meekest, most humble people I know, and he loves the Lord. Brethren, if you've not been involved in Bible studies, you're missing out on the greatest gift of life. And I hope that this will be a transformational moment for this church and for you individually. Because this is the mission of the gospel. This is what it's all about right here. And if we can get our members busy doing Bible studies, brothers and sisters, we'll turn this world right side up. Jesus said in John 4 and 35, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they're wide unto harvest. In my lifetime, the fields have never been so white. There are Bible studies everywhere right now. I will prove it to you before this seminar is over. I'm going to give you a few minutes to take a break. And um, I want to tell you just a few things. And every, every session, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, explaining. Because my job is not just to train you, it's to equip you. And out on those tables, my family, my family is here to talk to you. This is a family work. Every, every member of my family, my father's with me, we're all involved. And uh, you come talk to us. Just, just, uh, just sit down and ask us questions because we're here to serve. And um, one of the things I want to recommend, now the church is providing you those little booklets and that, that guidebook, that's provided by the church. Now, everything on that back table, it, we can't provide everything. So um, that, that, that stuff, that, those are tools. One of them is very important. It's called the Personal Evangelism Seminar. I just updated it at World Video Bible School where Rudy King and all the, the great work they do. And this entire seminar is on it. Now, moreover than that, Someone asked me just a few years ago, they said, Rob, we don't even know what a Bible study looks like. I said, okay, I'll film one. I called Don Blackwell. He's a good friend. I said, Don, could you set up the cameras at GBN so we can film a Bible study? He said, sure, Ken, and we did. We filmed the whole thing, all three studies. I call it from the Bible to the baptistry, and you can watch us do a Bible study. It's exciting. I love it. And uh, those are the kind of tools we have. I'm going to share one with you at each session. And... Um, if there's no other uh, words to be spoken, we're, let's just take five minutes and take a break. I, well, maybe ten minutes, you got food. So we're going to take ten minutes, take a break. Please don't leave. I have not even got started yet. I, I'm going to give you, before you leave, three things you can do to have a Bible study. You're going to learn them in the next lesson. You're going to write them down. I'm going to back every one of them with Scripture. So we've set the stage. Now we're ready to get started. So take a break. Enjoy the fellowship. Talk to us. We'll reassemble here about a quarter till, and we'll have our next session. God bless.